So we're going to show how to use the direct stiffness method with a very simple example to begin with. And we're going to consider the example in the notes where a system of three bars all acting in the x direction. And so let's draw the example. So we have a support wall and connected to the support wall is a bar and we're going to call this bar number two which has a cross-sectional area A and we have another bar that has a cross-sectional area of 2A and we're going to call this element number three this wall is what we're going to call node 3 and the left hand side of bars 2 and 3 are going to both be connected together by a very stiff element what we're going to call node 2. By very stiff it means that the displacement of the left hand side of bar 2 and bar 3 are both going to be identical. Connected into node 2, we're going to have another bar. It's not as long as bars at 2 and 3. This is going to, We're going to call this bar 1. And this is going to have a cross-sectional area of A. So what we're going to do is apply a force, an external force, which we're going to call F at the left hand side of bar A and the left hand side of bar A we're going to call node 1 so let's nodes is the locations of the ends of the bars and the elements are the names of the individual bars finally to complete the description of the example we need to know the lengths of the bars so let's put some dimensions on the system. And bars 2 and 3 are going to have a length of L. And bar 1 is going to have a length of L upon 2. With all of the data now that we know about this system of bars, we're going to set up the equations for each of the individual bars one at a time before we assemble all of the bars together to give the complete system so first of all we're going to take a look at bar number one so bar one we can say has the properties so let's change the pen Bar 1, at its left hand end, has a force F1, but I'm going to just write the generic, could have a force F1, could have a force F2, and has the properties cross-sectional area A, Young's modulus E, we're going to take Young's modulus E for all of the bars, so let's just say E everywhere. And now we have the length of L upon 2. So the 2 goes to the top there. And again, we have the 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. So we know we're multiplying the right displacements. And we have potential displacements at the ends of the bar of U1 and U2. So that's bar 1. We do exactly the same for bar 2. So look at the drawing here. And bar 2 had a length L, cross-sectional area A, and a Young's modulus of E. So let's write down the equations of equilibrium for bar 2 on its own. So bar 2 now, going back to the picture, is connecting nodes 2 and 3. So potential displacements of U2 and U3 and potential external forces of F2 and F3. So we're going to write that down in our matrix notation. So we have F2 and F3 
equals a e divided by l 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 multiplied by now u2 and u3 and we apply the identical procedure to set up the equation for bar 3 on its own so bar 3 well, let's remind ourselves looking at the drawing bar 3 has a length of l cross-sectional area 2a and a young's modulus of e and we're also again like bar 2 we're connecting nodes 2 and 3 together so writing that in our matrix format we have f2 and f3 these are potential external displacements is equal to 2a multiplied by e divided by l and we have 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 multiplying it out again by the displacements of the nodes u2 and u3 So now what we're going to show is how we can use these individual equations for the bars to set up a full system of equations for the entire system. And this process is what we call assembly. So what I'm going to do system equations is add all of the stiffnesses of the three bars together in a system of equations that's applicable to the entire system so the entire system could have an external force f1 at node 1 an external force f2 at node 2 and an external force f3 at node 3 Then, I'm just going to draw a big square block for the moment. And we know that we're going to have some factors of our properties, cross-section area A, Young's modulus E, and length of the bars L. And they would need to multiply by the free potential displacement of the nodes and that's u1 u2 and u3 so i know and i'm going to draw some lines here to help me in a minute but i could have so i've got three by one vectors of forces and three by one vector of displacement so my stiffness matrix for the entire system must be a three by three stiffness matrix so and i always like to do a quick mental check that the dimensions of the matrices work out correctly so when, especially when you're programming, it's always useful to make sure that you've dimensioned your vectors and matrices correctly. So this would be a three by three matrix. And to be able to multiply the first dimension, the number of rows must be three. And it is three rows multiplied by one. And if you multiply these out together, the two inner dimensions, this three and this three disappear. And you should be left with three by one vector when you multiply the matrix by the vector and if that's what you've got on the right hand side three by one you should have three by one on the left hand side which is what we've got three rows one column so the dimensions of the matrices are correct what i'm going to do now is i'm going to add the stiffnesses in for each of the bars one at a time I'm going to use a different color so for bar one I'm going to use a red pen 
And bar 1 had 2AE over L multiplied by the 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. And I'm going to put those numbers in the right slots in this matrix. So instead of 1 minus 1s, I'm now going to have 2 minus 2 minus 2, 2. So I'm now going to put the and bar 1 was connecting nodes 1 and 2. So the stiffness coefficients must go into the slots in the top left hand corner. So we have 2 minus 2 minus 2, 2. And they're the stiffness coefficients for the bar 1. For bar 2, again I'm going to use a different colour. Bar 2 had AE over L and no greater multiple of that. And bar 2 connected nodes 2 and 3 together. So we have 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. And they're multiplying out by U2 and U3. Finally, bar 3. And I'll use a different colour again. I'll use green. Bar 3 also had 2AE over L. So I'm going to use the coefficients 2 in there. And bar 3 is also connecting U2 and U3. So nodes 2 and nodes 3 together. I'm going to put those numbers in. So that would be 2 minus 2 minus 2 2. And now we have a full system of equations. What we're going to do is add the stiffness coefficients all together to give us a final set of equations. And in doing so, you'd recognise that we've added nothing together in the top right corner and the bottom left corner of the matrices. So that must be zero. And I'm going to rewrite these out, adding together these coefficients as we go along. So we have F1, F2 f3 is equal to and now we're just going to add all of the coefficients as they appear so we have 2 minus 2 0 minus 2 then we have 2 plus 2 plus 1 which is 5 then we have a minus 2 and a minus 1 which gives us a minus 3 then we have zero, we have nothing adding up in that bottom left hand corner. Then we have a minus two and a minus one, so that's a minus three in this little box. And finally, we have two plus one, so we have three. And find that would be multiplied by the A, E over L. We're just leaving these as letters for now, but these obviously could have real numbers for what the cross-sectional area is or the Young's modulus is again for the length and oops that shouldn't be of equals and that would be u1 u2 and u3 so at this moment in time what we've set up is the full set of system equations we're going to have to need to finish this out in a minute with a little bit more information. But let's just first of all have a look at this system of equations. So we have, and I'm going to just highlight these. We have zeros in these two slots here. So that's 1, 3 and 3, 1. Where the bars do not connect together. So going back to our original diagram of the system of equations node 1 is never di node 1 is never directly connected to node 3 so in our stiffness equations that's why we get zeros appear in the stiffness equations node 1 and node 3 are indirectly connected via all the bars talking to node 2 but they're never directly connected also, one of the other things that's really important, and it's a good thing if you ever coding this method, which you will be, is to check that the matrices are symmetric. So we have two, we have a minus two and a minus two, so that's the diagonal, a minus three and a minus three, zero and zero and three. So the system.
is symmetric. Okay, and that's just a good sanity check. At this moment in time, this system of equations is unsolvable. And the reason that it's unsolvable, we're going to presume that we know the properties A, E, and L. We as structural designers specify those properties. But what we don't know are the displacements, and these are what we're going to solve for. So that's unknown. So there's three unknowns there. And at this moment in time, we also don't know the forces F1, F2, and F3. So we have three equations and six unknowns. What we need to do is identify bits and pieces that we know about this system from the original drawing of the system so that we can reduce down to three three unknowns and then we've got three equations where we can solve those three unknowns so let's have a look let's go back all the way to the original picture if we look now at node number three we can see that node number three is supported it's completely supported along here so we know from this that u3 must be equal to zero if we now look at the left hand side we know that we are applying an external force so that we know now that f1 our general external force must be equal to f in magnitude but we also know that this force f is going in the negative x direction so we know that f1 equals minus f now there's one other thing we don't know um, and we can have a look at the system we can see looking at the system that node 2 here has to be in equilibrium from the forces coming from bar 1 bar 2 and bar 3 so we can say that the force F if we had an additional external force F2 it wouldn't be in equilibrium so we can say but F2 equals zero. Another way of looking at that is looking at the system and looking at the external forces. And again, there is no external force applied, applied to node two. So the external force F2 must be equal to zero. At node three, this isn't the case. At node three, we potentially have some reaction force R and we don't know what this value is yet. I can see by inspection, but actually we're going to calculate it properly later because it becomes more confusing uh, for more difficult situations. But I can see just from inspection, it must be equal to F in the plus direction for the whole system to be in equilibrium. Okay, so let's go back to our set of system equations and rewrite it with that information that we now know. So we're going to rewrite our force factor F1, we said was minus F. F2, we said there was no external force applied at node 2. And F3 is going to be an unknown reaction. I'm just going to leave it as F3, but you could write it as R for the reaction force if you liked. The system equations we know in its entirety we have 2 minus 2, 0 minus 2, 5 minus 3, 0 minus 3, 3. So we're just rewriting what we had above multiplied by A, E, and L. And finally, we're going to write down. At what we know about the displacements u1 is still unknown we don't know that u2 again we don't know what the displacement at node 2 is so it's still an unknown u2 finally we do know that u3 must be equal to zero 
So we have a system of equations where now we have three unknowns. We have F3, U1 and U2, which are all unknown. And we have three equations with which to solve it. Okay. So let's have one final look at the equations. And there's another useful piece for checking that your equations are set up correctly. So if we look at the top equation, so minus F two times AE over L times U1, minus two AE over L multiplied by U2, zero AE over L multiplied by zero. And that's not an equal sign, that's a multiply sign. So we have a known force on the left hand side, but an, so we have a known force F, but we have an unknown displacement U1. Similarly for the middle equation, we have a known force F2 on the left hand side, but an unknown displacement U2 on the right hand side. And we look at equation three, we have an unknown, draw that with a circle, an unknown force F3, but we do, draw it with a square, we do know the displacement. So for each equation, we either know the applied force or we know the displacement. We don't have any equations where both are unknown. Okay, and that's again another little sanity check when you're setting up the equations. Okay, so we have a set of equations, three unknowns, and most of us now have a graphics calculator, or if you're using MATLAB or other computer packages, we can solve a linear set of equations quite easily. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve this set of equations on our computer and we can do this either using an inbuilt equation solver or we can do the long laborious way by hand using Gaussian integration. We're not going to do that here. So for purposes of putting it into the computer, use AE and L are one and but your F is also one and you can get your answers in terms of F, L and AE and solve them. Now, if you were put to put this entire system of equations into your equation solver, whether that be on your calculator or in MATLAB, you won't get an answer. What you'll get is some very obscure message, especially in MATLAB, maybe that your system is ill-posed, I can't remember what the exact message is, but it will tell you that this is an equation. So. What we have to do is one final operation to make this a solvable system of equations. So this is called the full system. And now what we're going to do is take a look at this full system of equations. Over here on this right hand side, we know this displacement already. We have unknown displacements U1 and U2. But we already know this displacement. So that tells us that ideally I don't really need to solve equation 3 because I already know that what my displacement is. In this case it's 0. The other useful piece of information is that all of these parts of my matrices here are going to multiply this 0 multiplies by this zero. This minus three, again, multiplies, got row, multiply by column. So you're gonna minus three times by zero. And again, you can have three multiplying by zero. So your answer from all of this column is giving you zero. So that's kind of a, a waste of calculations. So what we can do is convert our full system to what we're calling a reduced system. So knowing that this third column of our stiffness matrices 
just multiplies out to be zeros. And that we already know our third displacement, u3, is equal to zero. So we don't want to recalculate that. Is we can rewrite the top two rows of the equations. And so we get, and I'll just change the color here. I'm going to make it green. So we had minus f zero equals two minus two minus two five and then we've got the coefficients a e and l multiplied by u1 and u2 and this now is a system of equations that you can solve on your calculator or in a linear equation solver in matlab okay so I'm going to leave you guys a couple of minutes to calculate those displacements. So if you put this system of equations in the computer, obviously you, into your calculator, you cannot put minus F. So just call that minus 1. And just leave this as 1 for the moment. So you can put your system of equations in. So minus 1, 0, 2, minus 2, minus 2, 5, multiplied by your unknowns, u1 and u2, into your calculator. You should get the solution, u1 equals minus 5 upon 6. And because we've used 1s for the f, l, a and e, we could... Like that is F L divided by A E. And we can put those numbers for whatever we choose to be F L and A in later. U2, the solution would be minus one third, and again that has to be multiplied to get the units right by F L divided by A E. So at this moment in time, we know everything or almost everything about the system. The only unknown left is the reaction force. Um, but we can also calculate what the force in the individual bars are. So we're going to do that next. And so, and I'll show you what the procedure is. And it is a procedure, so you can apply this procedure to every single bar. So... We write this internal bar forces. And using the unknown displacements, we can do that. So what we do is for bar one, we rewrite our equations just for bar one that we wrote earlier. And I'm gonna rewrite them here for convenience. We had F1, in bar one and f2 from bar two was equal to a e divided by l multiplied by two minus two minus two two and multiplied by u1 and u2 u1 and u2 but we've already just calculated what u1 and u2 were. So what we can do is insert those values. So for u1, we had minus 5 upon 6. F, L, A, E. And u2 was minus 1 third. F, L over A, E. And what we do now is multiply out our right-hand side and we can calculate our individual forces. F1 in bar 1, and that should be a 1 there for F2 in bar 1. And what we'll get if we multiply out this right-hand side, we get that our unknowns, the bar forces, so F1 in bar 1 and F2 in bar 1, 
are equal to minus f and plus f. So as you can see, the AE over L here and the AEs cancel out. So this L on the bottom. Okay. And we, we can do exactly the same procedure for bar 2 and bar 3. We're going to do that in a moment. But we can draw our free body diagram for bar number 1 at this moment in time. So we know that the force at the left-hand side was equal to minus f so going in the going to the left the negative x direction and at the right hand side we had plus f so going in the positive x direction and just to complete our free body diagram let's put the dimension on there but that was l upon 2 for bar number 1 okay and so we move on and we do exactly the same for bar number 2 we write down the element equations. So in this case, our element equations, we have F2 coming from bar 2 and F3 coming from bar 2 was equal to AE divided by L. Then we had our coefficients for this matrix. So 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. And that was multiplying out by the displacements at either end, which was U2 and U3. And again, now we can insert our known displacements that we've already calculated. So I'm going to delete those. and insert the known displacements that we have and we know that u2 was minus one third fl divided by a e and that u3 which we identified earlier must be equal to zero because node three was fixed and if we multiply out the right hand side we can calculate then and I'm not going to rewrite the left hand side, but our F2 from bar 2 is equal to minus one third of F. And our F3 in bar 2 was plus one third of F, whatever our value of our external force F is. And again, we can go on and we can draw our free body diagram. So that's the minus a third, so one third F minus, so we've got the arrow pointing to the left and we've got one third F. And one of the good things to note, in this case we have length L, the good thing to note is the bar on its own is in equilibrium as a third of f at either end pointing in equal and opposite directions so that's a good sanity check as we go along and finally we can do exactly the same procedure and get the internal forces in bar number three so we write down the equations that are applicable just to bar three on its own so we had f2 coming from bar three and f3 in bar three is equal to a e divided by l multiplied by 2 minus 2 minus 2 2 and multiplied by the displacements there which again would be u2 and u3 and again we know now the values of u2 and u3 so we're going to insert those into the equation so we know that u2 was minus one third of fl divided by a e and that f3 was zero so u3 was zero because the system was supported at node three 
again we can multiply out all of this right hand side and we get that our forces our internal forces in bar 3 are equal to minus two-thirds of F the left hand end and plus two-thirds of F at the right hand end and again finally we'll draw the free body diagram for this bar so we've got two-thirds of F two-thirds of F and again it's in an equilibrium on its own has to be and it had a length of L so at this moment in time we know all of the displacements in the system we know all of the internal forces in the system there's one final unknown in the entire system I'm just going to scroll back up and when we go back to our full system of equations, the final unknown that we don't know is F3, which is our reaction force. Okay. So, to calculate external forces or reaction forces, what we do in this case is... We rewrite the entire system equation. So that's equation 13 in the notes. I'm going to rewrite them out. So use full system equations. And that was minus F was the external force applied at node 1. No external force at node 2 and an unknown force F3 and we had A, E and L our system properties and our matrix 2, minus 2, 0 minus 2, 5, minus 3 0, minus 3, 3 and now what we're going to do is multiply this out with the known displacement U1, U2 and U3. And so let's multiply those out. I'm going to find them. So we have U1 was the minus 5 upon 6. FL divided by AE. We had U2 was minus one third FL divided by AE. And U3 was equal to zero. So we know everything on the right hand side of these equations. And what we could do is multiply the full system of equations out, or we just use the bottom row of the equations so we've got F3 is 0 times by U1 minus 3 times U2 and 3 times U3 so if you're using MATLAB sometimes you've already got the stiffness matrix you'll just multiply the full set of equations out and retrieve these three forces uh, if you're doing it on paper obviously just use the bottom row of the matrix equations okay so, I'm going to write it out in full, this bottom row. So, F3 is equal to 0 multiplied by U1. And we've got minus 3. So, this minus 3 multiplied by U2, which is the minus 1 third. And then, finally, we've got plus... three times u3 and also we have to multiply by the a e divided by l for this to be dimensionally consistent and we can multiply this out we've got zero there we also know that u3 is zero so we've got minus three 
times u2, and u2 was minus a third fl divided by ae. So multiplying out, you'll get, but f3 equals plus f. Let's make that neat. Plus f. So pointing to the right-hand side. I'm going to scroll all the way back up to our original drawing of the system. And indeed, so R must be equal, so the reaction or force F3 must be equal to F. And for the entire system to be in equilibrium, we have an external force F on the left-hand side balanced by an external force F on the right hand side so that must be correct and that is the full system of equations solved and every unknown in the system we're going to move on to some other examples to see how this system of solving the equations and solving for the unknowns is actually really useful but we're going to leave this example here